After the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One launched in November of 2013, it took until March of 2014 for the first true high-profile exclusive to come out. Sure, both platforms had exclusives at launch, but the main purpose of these titles were to show off graphical capabilities of the new hardware, to be tech demos, and not necessarily try to push advancements in gameplay or storytelling. Sucker Punch's infamous Second Son marked the first game in my eyes that wasn't just trying to sell you on pretty pictures, but on a whole single-player open-world experience, with its decision-based narrative and superhero gameplay. On March 21st, 2014, Infamous Second Son released as an exclusive for Sony's PlayStation 4 to strong approval, albeit not overwhelming praise, from both critics and fans. However, as the years ticked by, and Sony added one acclaimed exclusive after another to their library, Infamous Second Son became a game rarely mentioned, good or bad. It seems to be a game that has completely vanished from the minds of gamers. This left me questioning whether Infamous is a forgotten gem that is overshadowed by a dominant exclusive lineup, or whether critics and fans both overreacted to their first high-profile exclusive of a new generation. From a purely visual standpoint, Infamous Second Son impresses to say the least. Seattle is brought to life, and the graphics and skyboxes beg you to stop and stare. Lighting and particle effects especially stand out here. The frame rate for a console game at this level of fidelity is also very strong. I mean, it is a console game, so it's far from perfect, but the drops were never big enough to hamper my experience, and when the game was looking good and running at 60 FPS, oh man, it was a treat. The cutscenes are also a standout, ramping up the graphics and lighting to 11. While the lip syncing is good, however, there is something off about these character models and facial expressions at times. They're not bad, and there are some times when they are impressive, but there is definitely something off about them. The music is the presentation's biggest downfall by far. I honestly can barely remember a single track from the game, and there wasn't a single moment when the music kicked in to make a moment more memorable. The music isn't annoying, so I guess it technically could have been worse, but for a first-party AAA story-driven experience, I'm honestly shocked and disappointed that the soundtrack didn't contribute more. And that may be one of the reasons why the story never hits as hard as it could have. Speaking of story... Delson, voiced by the one and only Troy Baker, is a decent protagonist. He is a kind of a punk rocker, wisecracking jackass teen. He's a fun character, albeit not the most memorable. Delson has the perfect setup, though, to be on the fence morally, the perfect setup to have to choose right from wrong. He's an outsider and a troublemaker, a young adult that kinda acts like an angsty teen. He's a community nuisance who commits petty crimes, but still clearly connects to some members of the tribe. Unfortunately, for a game predicated on choice and morals, Delson does not really feel like a dynamic character, even if Troy Baker does a great job as always. The main villain, Augustine, is fine and serves her role in the story, but is a far cry from the likes of Voss, Truth, and Kerrigan. It took me a while to put my finger on why Augustine, despite being well voice acted like the rest of the cast, falls a step short. For starters, Augustine just doesn't have nearly enough screen time for the player to learn to hate her. You only see her in a few cutscenes. Also, she doesn't really have any particular strengths that define her as a character. She isn't sympathetic, charismatic, batshit crazy, or pure evil like many of the best and most memorable villains. Augustine's defining trait is she's just kind of a smug bitch. So it is satisfying when you do get to knock that smile off her face, but it fails to leave a lasting impact. Hell, she doesn't even have the really cool look thing going for her. I mean, just look at her. Her design is boring and hardly makes me shake in fear or just say, wow, she looks really cool. She just looks like a kinda strangely dressed average lady. The side characters, like the villain, are kind of fine, but ultimately don't add much. Like Augustine, they don't have enough screen time to flesh them out, or an interesting enough story or personality to make us feel attached to them. Reggie is the best of all of them, Travis Willingham does a really good job of voicing the character, and he is written in a way that makes him believable as someone who toes the line between cop and brother. I do like the concept of the outcasts of the society rising up to fight back against their oppressors. It's cool in concept, but never reaches its potential. One saving grace, though, that Infamous has for it is it does do a lot of little things right. It's attention to details in the environment around you or how it foreshadows your powers to come. All these little things do enough to enhance the narrative a bit. 
The one part that truly stands out of the story is when Delson returns home and spray paints a memorial to his brother, the same one he vandalized in the beginning. It's not a magical ending that leaves a long-lasting impression, but it is a nice end to a game that brings everything full circle. The story in Second Son is fine and does its job in keeping the player invested for the runtime, but never rises above and becomes something special. One of the main selling points behind Second Son is the karma system and either going down the good path to become a hero or down the bad path to become infamous. Now I'm not normally a fan of branching storylines, but that's not because I don't think they can work, but because far too often they are poorly implemented. How would a Second Son fare in this regard? Well, considering the fact that this was a selling feature, not well at all. The game might as well just ask you at the beginning whether you want to play through the good or the bad story. I understand the desire to make the player feel like they are consistently making moral decisions, but that's all it is, an illusion, smoke and mirrors. This screen, the first choice, basically decides your entire playthrough. Yes, you can technically change course, but it's not beneficial from a gameplay standpoint to do so. From a story standpoint, the differences in the good karma story and the bad karma story is minimal. And when there is a difference, such as the ending, one side is clearly better. The good ending is clearly the more fulfilling one, as the final cutscene there is heartfelt moment that brings the game full circle, as mentioned earlier. The bad storyline ending, or the infamous ending, has potential as a story of the ends not justifying the means, of losing sight of where you come from and letting the vision of your goals be tainted. However, that's all just potential, and the story flirts with these ideas but never commits. The bad storyline is much worse than the good, and it is capped off with a laughably awful conclusion, which makes you wonder why even have it as an option at all. Movement is one of the strengths of Second Son. Dashing, hovering, running up walls, moving through vents, and flying all felt liberating. Whether you're traversing Seattle or trying to gain a potential edge on your enemy, movement is fast, engaging, and enjoyable. Two things hold the movement system back, however, the most damning being the lack of a double dash until you upgrade it. I understand not wanting to have players have infinite dashes, but restricting the use of the power to one before touching a surface makes hopping from building to building feel restricted when those buildings are far away. The other main issue I have with the movement is surfaces that jettison out from the buildings, such as balconies, makes it difficult when scaling the side of said building. Far too often the game doesn't automatically allow your character to maneuver over the obstacle. They will register that it is there sometimes, and you will go around it, but other times you won't be so lucky, stopping your momentum in the tracks and creating an inconsistent experience. However, those two main issues do not hold the movement system back as a whole, and it is something still working to infamous Second Son's advantage. The core gameplay in Infamous Second Son is fine. It combines its movement system with a combination of projectile and melee attacks. Normally, you do your best to subdue as many enemies as you can in order to acquire your superpower, or go on a rampage if you're doing an evil playthrough. The problem with this being the core gameplay loop is that it encourages players to attack the smaller, easier enemies while ignoring the bigger, tougher ones until you can automatically take them out with your giant superpower. It would be like if in Halo, you had to kill 8 enemies until you could more or less instantly clear the encounter of all the remaining enemies. You would target the grunts and jackals, right? And that would mean you would rarely have to take down an elite, and elites are the most interesting and challenging enemies in the game. The same logic can be applied here in Second Son. The tougher, more interesting enemies are often completely ignored. Now, this isn't always the case. Yes, there are opportunities where this strategy doesn't work due to either a lack of smaller enemies, or if you haven't acquired your superpower for that specific power you're using yet, but it cannot be denied that the potential to fight more interesting enemies was downplayed in this title. Let's talk about the superpowers you will be using. For the majority of the game, you will be using smoke, neon, and video power. These powers are definitely unique from powers in other games, and are a nice change of pace from, say, water and fire and wind powers. However, using more stereotypical and recognizable powers could have played up the superhero origin story pastiche element a little more, which is something this game clearly aims for at times. The powers, however, while unique aesthetically, don't differ enough in gameplay. None of the powers really feels that unique from one another, and most importantly, the powers just feel like straight upgrades. I never felt the need to go back to a previous power except when I ran out of ammo and an older power was the only one readily available, or the few times the game forces you to do so. 
true, giving each power too much of a specialty role could have led to a game playing more akin to a traditional third-person shooter, something it already flirts with a bit. I'm glad Neon wasn't exclusively a long-range weapon and Video exclusively a close-range SMG, but having every power be viable all the time leads to powers that don't really fill any kind of niche role, leading to a game that, despite a shorter runtime, feels a little repetitive. This isn't helped by the mission design, which follows a similar structure for a lot of the game. You have a mission investigating Conduit, then you fight them as a boss to get a power. Then you go collect Blast Shards and add abilities to that power. Then you do some sort of a mission with the person you just helped, and then start the process all over, basically three times. Sure, there's some slight variation, but for the most part, that is the combat loop. Another big issue I have with the combat is the way the health system was handled. Second Sun uses a regenerating health system which directly contradicts its dual combat system. I often found it more effective to pop shots at my enemies from a distance than to melee them up close. To be fair to Infamous, you can regain full health by draining more power, which is a good idea, but it could have been expanded more. Speaking of which, I feel like managing your powers could have been expanded more as a whole. The only thing that draining power affects is your projectile, lethal, and non-lethal attacks leaving dashing, hovering, and melee available no matter how much juice you have in the tank. I wish everything was affected. This could lead to jolts of going from an unstoppable force to a vulnerable human being. It would also put more pressure on the player for more careful planning to be taken, as escapes would not be as readily available. The bosses are the last major thing worth mentioning, and they are serviceable, the highlight being your fight with Eugene. Your fight with Fetch had potential, draining Neon to take away her powers and making the room dark, but it fell flat in execution. Your final fight with Augustine could have been a little more challenging, but it's still a decent final boss. The enormous DUP agent is just an enemy you fight later, except here he's labeled as a boss, so it's barely even worth mentioning in this section. Overall, boss battles are not as good as, say, Doom, and nowhere near as good as bosses in a boss rush title like Bloodborne, but they do connect gameplay and story and are certainly harder than most of the enemies you encounter. And they don't hurt the experience like another game I know. Overall, it may have sounded like I harped on the gameplay too much, but that's because it has some genuine flaws. It is still fun in short bursts, though. The fast, freeing, and aggressive movement combined with projectile and melee combat makes for an enjoyable, but flawed, gameplay experience. The open world component for Infamous Second Son is definitely on the weaker side of the ones I've come across. It uses the same checklist icons and map formula that Ubisoft has made so famously popular. You do little tasks to lower DUP control in an area to force a showdown for complete control of a district. The problem is most of these tasks are downright boring. You destroy cameras and spray paint sides of buildings and other forgettable tasks like that. There's nothing here that expands the universe or characters. The other thing you can do in the open world is do little tasks in order to press further into becoming a villain or a hero. For example, players on the hero track can bust drug deals while villains can kill conduit protesters. Again, nothing that offers much value. The one thing I will say about Infamous's open world is that I do like the fact that it is open world. Normally I hate bad open worlds because it feels like they took a linear game and just made it open world to put it on the back of the box and run up playtimes. Due to Infamous's liberating powers and movement, however, it was definitely the right call to make the world free and open to traverse. It should have just been executed better. I also like how depending on what path you take, citizens will either praise you or jeer you while running in fear. Again, those are the little details that do help Infamous out in the end. Players upgrade Delson by finding blast shards around the map and use them to purchase upgraded powers. The upgrades you get aren't very interesting. Often it's just extra ammo capacity for either your normal or lethal attacks. There are a few exceptions, but overall I found the options underwhelming. The time in between unlocking the first three powers is good, however I wish you got concrete earlier. I understand this wouldn't make much sense from a narrative standpoint, but it is also disappointing that you can only use the final power in the main story against the final boss. Maybe if you could use it for the tower climb segment of the final mission, it would have satisfied my desire to use concrete against the main enemies at some point during the story. I definitely feel like Second Son could have done a better job at making the player feel more powerful as they progressed through the story. I don't feel like either the gameplay or story is enough to drive the experience. They are both fine, but the graphics are clearly the biggest appeal here, and at the time they may have been enough. But since March of 2014, countless other first and third party games have come out and eclipsed Second Son in the visuals department. Infamous was just a tech demo that was four months late that seems destined to be a game left behind, even if it still can be an enjoyable ride.